The Enchanted Wine Jug, or Why the Cat and Dog Are Enemies, as translated by Horace Newton Allen. In ancient times, there lived an old gray-haired man by the river's bank where the ferry boats land. He was poor but honest, and being childless and compelled to earn his own food, he kept a little wine shop, which, small though it was, was possessed quite a local reputation, for the aged proprietor would permit no quarreling on his premises, and sold only one brand of wine, and this was a really excellent quality. He did not keep a pot of broth simmering over the coals at the door to tempt the passerby, and thus increase his thirst on leaving. The old man rather preferred the customers who brought their little long-necked bottles and carried the drink to their own homes. There were some peculiarities, almost mysteries, about uh, this little wine shop. The old man had apparently always been there, and had never seemed any younger. His wine never gave out, no matter how great uh, might be the local thirst. Yet he was never seen to make or take in a new supply. Nor had he a great array of vessels in his shop. On the contrary, he always seemed to pour the wine out of the one and same old bottle, the long slender neck of which was black and shiny for being tipped uh, so often in his old hand while the generous warming stream gurgled outwards to the bowl. This had long ceased to be a matter of inquiry, however, and only upon the advent of a stranger of an inquiring mind would the subject be rediscussed. The neighbors were assured that the old man was thoroughly good, and that his wine was better. Furthermore, he sold it as reasonably as other men sold a much inferior article. And more than this, uh, did they not care to know, or at least if they did once care, they had gotten over it, and were now content to let well enough alone. I said the old man had no children. That is true, yet he had that which, in a slight degree, took the place of children. In that they were his daily care, his constant companions, and the partners of his bed and board. These deputy children were none other than a good-natured old dog, with a laughing face and eyes, long silken ears that were ever on the alert, yet too soft to stand erect, a chunky neck, and a large round body covered in soft tan hair, and ending with a bushy tail. He was the very impersonation of canine wisdom and good nature, and seldom became ruffled unless he saw his master worried by the ill behavior of one of his patrons, or when a festive flea persisted in attacking him on all sides at once. His fellow, a cat, would sometimes assist in the onslaught, when the dog was about to be defeated and completely ruffled by his tormentor. This Thomas was also a character in his own way. Though past the days when his chief ambition had been to catch his tail, he had a, such strong vein of humor running through him that age could not subdue his frivolous propensities. He had been known to drop a dead mouse upon the dog's nose uh, from the counter, while the latter was endeavoring to get a quiet nap. Then he would blow up his tail as a balloon, hump his back, and look utterly shocked at such conduct, as the startled dog nearly jumped out of his skin, and growling horribly tore around as though he was either in chase of a wild beast, or being chased by one. This happy couple lived in the greatest contentment with the old man. They slept in a little Kong room with him at night, and enjoyed the warm stone floor, with its slick oil paper covering as much as did their master. When the old man would go out on a mild moonlit night to enjoy a pipe of tobacco and gaze at the stars, his companions would rush out and announce to the world that they were not asleep, but ready to encounter any and everything that the darkness might bring forth, so long as it did not enter their master's private court, of which they were in possession. These two were fair weather companions up to this time, they had not been with the old man when a bowl of rice was a luxury. Their days did not annotate with the period of successful wine shop history. The old man, however, often recalled those former days with a shudder, and thought with great complacency of the time when he had befriended a divine being in the form of a weary human traveler, to whom he gave the last drink his jug contained. 
and how, when the contents of the little jug had gurgled down the stranger's throat in a long, unbroken draught, the stranger had given him a trifling little thing that looked like a bit of amber, saying, Drop this into your jug, old man, and as long as it remains there, you will never want for a drink. He did so, and sure enough, the jug was heavy with something. So he raised it to his lips and, uh, could he believe it? A most delicious stream of wine poured down his parched throat. He took the jug down and peered into its black depths, shook its sides, and caused the elf within to dance and laugh aloud. And shutting his eyes, again he took another long draught. Then, meaning well, he remembered the stranger and was about to offer him a drink, when he discovered that he was all alone, and he began to wonder at the strange circumstance, and to think what he was to do. Well, I can't sit here and drink all the time, or I will be drunk, and some thief will carry away my jug. I can't live on wine alone, yet I dare not leave this strange thing while I seek for work. Like many another to whom fortune has just come, he knew not for a time what to do with his good luck. Finally, he hit upon the scheme of keeping a wine shop, the success of which we have seen, and have perhaps refused the old man credit for the wisdom he displayed in continuing on in such a small scale, rather than exciting unpleasant curiosity and official oppression by turning up his jug and attempting to produce wine at wholesale. The dog and cat knew the secret, and had ever a watchful eye upon the jug, which was never for a moment out of sight of one of the three pairs of eyes. As the brightest day must in gloom, however, so was this pleasant state soon to be marred by a most sad and far-reaching accident. One day, the news flashed around the neighborhood that the old man's supply of wine was exhausted, and that a drop remained in his jug, and he had no more uh, with which to refill it. Each man, upon hearing the news, ran to see if it were indeed true, and the little straw thatched hut, with its small court encircled by a mud wall, were soon filled with anxious seekers after the truth. The old man admitted the statement to be true, but had little to say. While the dog's ears hung negligently over his cheeks, his eyes dropped, and he looked as though he might be asleep, but for the persistent manner in which he refused to lie down, but dignifiedly bore his portion of the sorrow sitting upright with his borrowed head. Thomas seemed to have been charged with agitation enough for the whole family. He walked nervously about the floor until he felt that justice to his tail demanded a higher plane, where shoes could not offend, and then betook himself to the center, and laid to the beam which supported the roof, and made a sort of cats and rats attic under the thatch. All consoled the old man, and not one but regretted that their supply of cheap, good wine was exhausted. But the old man offered no explanation, though he had about concluded in his own mind that, as no one knew the secret, he must have in some way poured the bit of amber into a customer's jug. But who possessed the jug he could not surmise, nor could he think of any way of reclaiming it. He talked the matter over carefully and fully to himself at night, and the dog and cat listened attentively, winking knowingly at each other, and puzzling their brains uh, as much as to do uh, and what to be done and how they were to assist their kind old friend. At last, the old man fell asleep, and then sitting down face to face by his side, the dog and the cat began a discussion. I am sure, uh, says the cat, that I can detect the thing if I only come within smelling distance of it. But how do we know where to look for it? That was a puzzler, but the dog proposed that they make a search uh, through every house in the neighborhood. Oh, we can go on a mere kung yong, look -see, you know, and while you call upon the cats indoors, keep your smellers open, I will yang chi chat with the dogs outside. And if you smell anything, you can tell me. The plan seemed to be the only good one, and it was adopted that very night. They were not cast down because the first search was unsuccessful, and continued their work night after night. Sometimes their calls were not appreciated, and in a few cases they had to clear the field by battle before they could go on with the search. No house was neglected, however, and in due time they had done the whole neighborhood, but with no success. They then determined that it must have been carried to the other side of the river, 
to which place they decided to extend their search as soon as the water was frozen over, so they could cross over the ice. For they knew they would not be allowed in the crowded ferry boats, and while the dog could swim, he knew that the water was too icy for that. As soon as it grew very cold, the river froze so solidly that the bull carts, ponies, and all passed over on the ice. And so it remained for near two months, allowing for the searching party uh, to return each morning to their poor old master, who seemed completely broken up by the loss and did not venture away from his door, except to buy the few provisions that, to which his little fund of savings would allow. Time flew by without bringing success to the faithful comrades, and the old man began to think that they too were deserting him, as his old customers had done. It was nearing the time for the spring thaw and a uh, freshet, when one night as the cat was chasing around the roof timbers in a house away from the outside of the settlement across the river, that he detected an odor which caused him to stop so suddenly as to nearly precipitate himself upon a sleeping man in the floor below. He carefully traced up the odor and found that it came from a soapstone tobacco box that sat in the top of a high a cloth press nearby. The box was dusty and neglect, and Thomas concluded that the possessor had accidentally turned the coveted gem, for it was that from which the odor came, out into the wine bowl and, not knowing the nature, had put it into the stone box rather than throw it away. Yeah, the lid was so securely fastened that the box seemed to be one solid piece, and in despair of opening it, the cat went out to consult the superior wisdom of the dog and to see what could be done. I can't uh, get up there, said the dog, nor can you bring me the box or I might break it. I cannot move the thing or I might push it off and let it fall to the floor and break, said the cat. So after explaining the things they could not do, the dog finally hit upon a plan that might uh, perhaps successfully carry out. I will tell you, said he. You go and see the chief of the Rat Guild in this neighborhood, and tell him that if he will help you in this matter, we will both let him alone for ten years, and not hurt even a mouse of them. But what good is that going to do? Why, don't you see that the stone is no harder than some wood, and that they can take turns at it, until they gnaw hole through, and then we can easily get the gem. The cat bowed before the marvelous judgment of the dog, and went off to accomplish with the somewhat difficult task of obtaining an interview with the master rat. Meanwhile, the dog wagged his ears and tail and strode out with swinging stride in imitation of the great Yang Bang, or official, who occasionally uh, walked past his master's door, and who seemed to denotate by his haughty gait his superiority to other men. His importance made him impudent, and when the cat returned, to his dismay, he found his friend engaged in a genuine fight with a lot of curs, who had dared to incur upon his period of self-congratulation. Thomas mounted the nearest wall and howled so lustily uh, that the inmates of the house, awakened by the uproar, came out and dispersed with the contestants. The cat had found the rat, who, upon being assured of the safety, came out of the mouth of his hole and listened attentively to the proposition. It was needless to say he accepted it, and contract was made forthwith. It was arranged that work was to be done at once, and to be continued by relays as long as they could work undisturbed. And when the box was perforated, the cat was to be summoned. The ice had now broken up, and the pair could not return home very easily, so they waited about the neighborhood for some months, picking up a scant living, and making many friends and not a few enemies, for they were a proud pair and ready to fight upon provocation. It was warm weather when one night the cat almost forgot his compact when he saw a big fat rat slinking along towards him. He crouched low and dug his long claws into the earth, while every nerve seemed on the jump. But before he was ready to spring upon his prey, he fortunately remembered his contract. And just in time too, for as the rat was none other than the other party to the contract, as such a mistake at the time would have been fatal to their object. The rat announced the hole was complete, but was so small at the inside end that they were at a loss to know how to get the gem out unless the cat could reach in with his paw. Having acquired uh, the dog with the good news, the cat uh, hurried off to see for himself. He could introduce his paw, 
but as the object was at the other end of the box, he could not quite reach it. We were in a dilemma and were about to give up when the cat again went to consult with the dog. The latter promptly told him to put a mouse in the box to let him bring out the gem. They did so, but the hole was too small for the little fellow and his load to get out at the same time. So that with much pushing and pulling had to be done before they were successful. They got it safely at last, however, and gave it at once to the dog for safekeeping. Then, with much purring and wagging of tails, the contract of friendship was again renewed, and the strange party broke up, the rats to go and jubilate over their safety, the dog and cat to carry the good news to their mourning master. Again, canine wisdom was called into play in devising a means for crossing the river. The now happy dog was equal uh, to such a trifling thing as this, however, and instructed the cat that he must take the gem in his mouth, hold it well between his teeth, and mount his, uh, the dog's, back, where he could hold on firmly to the long hair of his neck while he swam across the river. This was agreed upon, and arriving at the river, they put the plan in execution. All was well, until, as they neared the opposite bank, a party of school children chanced to notice them coming, and after their amazement at the strange sight wore away, burst into uproarious laughter, which increased uh, the more they looked at the absurd sight. They clapped their hands and danced with glee, and while some fell on the ground and rolled around in exhaustion and merriment at seeing a cat astride a dog's back and being ferried across the river. The dog was too weary and consequently matter-of-fact to see much fun in it, but the cat shook his sides until his agitation caused the dog to take in great gulps of water in attempting to keep his head up. This but increased the cat's merriment, until he broke out into a laugh as hearty as that of the children, and to doing so, dropped the precious gem into the river. The dog, seeing the sad accident, dove at once for the gem, regardless of the cat, who could not let go in time to escape and was dragged down into the water. Sinking his claws into the dog's skin in his agony of suffocation caused him so much pain that he missed the object of his search and came to the surface. The cat got ashore in some way, greatly angered at the dog's rude conduct. The latter, however, cared little for that, and as soon as he had shaken the water from his hide, made to lunge at his unlucky companion, who had lost the result of half a year's faithful work in one moment of foolishness. Dripping like a drowned cat, Thomas was, however, able to climb a tree, and there he stayed until the sun had dried the water from his fur, and he had spat the water from his in uh, words, uh, in the constant spitting he kept up at his now enemy, who kept barking ferociously about the tree below. The cat knew that the dog was dangerous when aroused, and was careful not to descend from his perch until the coast was clear. Though at one time he really feared the ugly boys would knock him off with stones as they passed. Once down, he has ever been since careful to avoid the dog, with whom he has never patched up the quarrel. Nor does he wish to do so, for the very sight of a dog causes him to remember that horrid cold ducking and the day spent up a tree, and involuntarily he spits as though still filled with the river water, and his tail blows up as it had never learned to do so until the day for when so long its damp and draggled condition would not permit uh, for assuming a haughty shape. This accounts for the scarcity of cats and the popularity of dogs. The dog did not give up his efforts, even now. He dove many times in vain, and spent most of the following day sitting on the river bank, apparently lost in thought. Thus the winter found him, his two chief aims apparently beginning to find the gem and to kill the cat. The latter kept well out of his way, and the ice now covered the place where the former lay hidden. One day he espied a man spearing fish through the hole in the ice, as was very common, having a natural desire to be around where anything uh, eatable was being displayed, and feeling a sort of proprietary ship with this particular part of the river the man was now fishing, and where he himself had, had such a sm sad experience. He went down and looked on. As a fish came up, something seemed to greet his nostrils, and then as the man laid down his catch, the dog grabbed it and rushed off in greatest haste. He ran with all his might to his master, who, the poor man, was now at the end of his string. A coin in Korea is perforated and hung upon a string. He was almost reduced to begging. He was therefore delighted when his faithful old friend brought upon him so acceptable a present as fresh fish. He had once commenced dressing it, but when he slid his open, 
and to his infinite joy, the long-lost gem fell out of the fish's belly. The dog was too happy to contain himself, uh, but uh, jumping upon his master, he licked him with his tongue, struck him with his paws, barking, uh, meanwhile, as though he had again treed the cat. As soon as their joy had become somewhat natural, the old man carefully placed the gem in his trunk, from which uh, he took the last money he had, together with some fine clothes, relics of his more fortunate days. As he had feared, he might soon pawn these clothes, and had even shown them to the brokers. But now he took them out to put them on, as his fortune had returned to him. Leaving the fish, baking on the coals, he donned his fine clothes, and taking the last money, went and purchased wine for his feast. And for a beginning, he knew that once he placed the gem back in the jug, the supply of wine would not cease. On his return, he and the good dog made a happy feast of the generous fish, and the old man completely recovered his spirits, to which he quaffed deeply of the familiar liquid to which his mouth was now such a stranger. Going to his trunk directly, he found to his amazement that it contained another suit of clothes, exactly like the first ones he had removed, while there lay also a broken string of cash, of just the amount he had just previously taken out. Sitting down to think, the whole truth dawned upon him, and he saw how he had abused the privilege uh, before in being content to use his talisman simply to run a wine shop, while he might have had the money and everything else in abundance by simply giving the charm a chance to work. Acting on this principle, the old man eventually became immensely wealthy, for he could always duplicate anything with this piece of amber. He carefully tended his faithful dog, who in his remaining days uh, never molested a rat, and never lost the opportunity to attack every cat he saw.